Pamela and Michael Mayfield, ages five and six respectively, were both kindergarten students in the 1984 through 1985 school year. While Pamela was a first-time kindergarten student, this was Michael's second time at the grade level. Due to concerns about his emotional maturity, the school and family had agreed that it would be best for Michael to repeat kindergarten before advancing to first grade. Both siblings were enrolled at Betsy Ross Elementary School, which was just a short walk from their home in Houston, Texas. The children's home was full of family. They, along with their mother Cynthia, lived with their grandmother as well as one of their aunts and a cousin. Since they lived so close to their school, their mother would occasionally allow them to walk home from school by themselves. When they asked permission to do so on January 10, 1985, Cynthia said yes. Her two children would never make it home that day. Witnesses reported seeing Michael and Pamela playing in a playground at an apartment complex that was on their route home from school. Later in the afternoon, witnesses saw the two children getting into the back of a green car. The car was being driven by a man, but no one who saw him recognized him. Pamela and Michael appeared to have been abducted. This conclusion was questioned four months after the two siblings went missing, however. A man called police and told them that Pamela and Michael were not missing at all. Rather, they were staying with family in Los Angeles. The Mayfields did have family in LA, but authorities spoke with them and did not find Michael and Pamela to be with them. The caller's claims having been discredited, Michael and Pamela's case is officially considered a non-family abduction. If they are still alive, as of 2018, Michael will be 40 and Pamela will be 39. Monday, November 23, 1992, got off to a rough start for the Sutton family. The three children in the family missed the bus and had to walk to school. After dropping their younger brother George up at his school, the two oldest children, Chad 16 and Melanie 14, began walking to their own school. However, they never made it there. After Chad and Melanie went missing, it was discovered that they had been planning to hitchhike from Manala, the suburb of Brisbane, Australia, where they lived with their mother all the way to Perth. Both their biological father and their maternal grandmother lived in Perth, so the two siblings could have been planning to visit either one of them. If Chad and Melanie did begin to hitchhike across the country, they could have met with foul play or succumbed to the elements almost anywhere in Australia. However, not everyone believes that Chad and Melanie made it very far from home. In 2017, Claire Snow, a classmate of Chad and Melanie, spoke with the press about her belief that the siblings could have been killed by a local trio of bullies. The three bullies were known to beat up both Chad and Melanie regularly. They were highly violent according to Ms. Snow, who herself was once hit over the head with a plank of wood by these bullies. The trio was further emboldened by their families, who would often accompany them when they would come to the Sutton home to further torment Melanie and Chad. Ms. Snow believes these bullies and their families to be capable of killing. She further claims that the bullying would escalate if any of the trio's targets would fight back and that just prior to his disappearance, Chad Sutton lashed back at his tormentors with a bat in self-defense. According to Ms. Snow, the main rumor at Anala High School following Chad and Melanie's disappearance was that they had been killed by the bullies and their families and their bodies had been hidden out in the bush. This area was later developed for housing, and no sign of Chad or Melanie's remains were found in the process. If the Sutton siblings did meet with foul play close to home, their remains were hidden elsewhere. In 2016, Chad and Melanie's mother, Marie, died of a massive heart attack at age 52. Her mother, Jean Turek, believes Marie's early death was really the result of a broken heart over the loss of Chad and Melanie. Chad and Melanie's father has also passed away since their disappearance. Their grandmother still hopes to one day make Chad and Melanie's favorite roast dinner for her. Before we continue, we have a surprise for you. We have made a new channel in which we upload cold mystery cases that will shiver your timbers. Don't miss out link is in description. Philoma and Milana Luke grew up on the island of Saipan in the northern Mariana Islands. The sisters, who were only a year apart in age, were inseparable. Ten-year-old Philoma was in the third grade and nine-year-old Milana in the second grade at Kagman Elementary School. On the morning of May 25, 2011, the girls were seen waiting for the bus to school at a bus shelter near their home in Estelle. The girls never arrived at school. Both of the girls' teachers were surprised that Philoma and Melina were not in school that day. They had each only missed a day or two of school the entire year. Furthermore, that day, Philoma's class was scheduled to cook some local dishes as part of class. Her teacher was surprised that Philoma would miss the activity she had so been looking forward to. 
However, the policy in public schools on Saipan does not instruct teachers to call home about an absent student until he or she has missed three consecutive days of class. Therefore, the girl's family did not realize that they were missing until they failed to return home after school. Northern Mariana Island investigators were assigned to the case, as well as FBI agents out of the Honolulu field office, as the Northern Mariana Islands are a U.S. Commonwealth. The day after the girls went missing, agents began a four-day search of a local landfill. After searching over 30,000 cubic feet of trash, investigators found no evidence linked to the missing girls. A tracking dog from Hawaii's Civil Defense Agency was flown in to search for the girls in the thick jungles on Saipan. When Philoma and Melina went missing, they had been living with their maternal grandparents. Their mother was based in Guam and their father, a former law enforcement officer on Saipan, was living in the Federated States of Micronesia. This opened the possibility that Paloma and Melina had been taken by one of their parents as part of a custody dispute. Investigators traveled to speak with the girls' parents and search for their homes, but there was no evidence that either parent had taken the girls. In 2014, the FBI released age progress photos of both sisters. They launched a media campaign in Hawaii, Oregon, and Washington state. Agents did not have any indication that Paloma and Molina were in any of those states. However, all three states did have large communities of people originally from the Northern Marian Islands. The FBI hoped that by expanding the area they were looking for witnesses in, they might finally receive the tip they needed to solve the case. However, that tip never came from this outreach. In 2018, local police and the FBI used a backhoe to dig up an area behind the home of the late Anna Chrysostomo. After receiving a tip that the remains of Philoma and Melina were buried there, Ms. Chrysostomo was the mother of Joseph A. Chrysostomo, who'd been sentenced in 2014 to life in prison for the murder of Emerita Romero. While Chrysostomo had a criminal record that went back even prior to the Romero murder, that fact exonerated him and Philoma and Melina's disappearance rather than making him a stronger suspect. He had been incarcerated at the time Philoma and Melina went missing. The five-year prison term he had been serving at the time did not end until December 2011, seven months after the girls disappeared. The search did not turn up any remains or any evidence in Philoma or Merlina's disappearance whatsoever. The search therefore did little except for upsetting both families involved. Albert Quitegua, the girl's grandfather, alleges that his family was not informed of the search by police. They instead learned of it from online media outlets. The news that authorities were searching for remains was upsetting for the entire family and traumatizing for the girl's mother. The Christostomo family also was upset over the suspicion that the search placed them under and the damage to their property that it caused. Two of Anna's adult children and their families had been living at the property at the time of the search. One of those children, Annie Christostomo, alleges that the search unfairly connected her family to Philoma and Melina's disappearance and was done by police. To shame the entire family. The family filed a motion in Superior Court to unseal the supporting documents used to obtain the search warrant used to search their property. So as to protect the investigation into Philoma and Melina's disappearance, they are willing to submit to a gag order in regards to any documents they and their counsel are provided with. The legal proceedings are ongoing. As of 2018, the girl's case is still open, and leads are still actively being investigated. On the seventh anniversary of Philoma and Melina's disappearance, their family held a massive special intention at the Santa Soledad Church. Despite years without knowing where Philoma and Melina are, their grandfather continues to pray that answers will come in the next few years and end the family's pain. In June of 1974, the Leslie family made the decision to move 300 miles from Page, Arizona to Mesa. Jack Leslie was suffering from terminal lung cancer and living in Mesa meant that he could be closer to his doctors. He and his wife Uma had three daughters, but their oldest daughter Linda was married and living in Tucson with her husband and two children. Their youngest two daughters, Cindy, 15, and Jackie, 13, made the move to the Desert Sands mobile home community with them. On the night of July 31st, 1974, Jack and Irma attended church together. They left Cindy and Jackie at home with their grandmother. However, when Jack and Irma returned home, the girls were not there. According to their grandmother, Cindy had answered a phone call earlier in the evening. She and her sister had left a note reading Irma decided to sleep on the couch so she would wake up when the girls came home. They never did. When Irma awoke in the morning, she called the police. Initial searches for Cindy and Jackie took place in the orange groves that surrounded their neighborhood. 
Searchers were unable to locate any physical evidence. When Maricopa County Sheriff's deputies began investigating the note the girls left, they looked for the family the girls could have been going to babysit for. They found no family that claimed to have hired the girls. A few days after the girls went missing, their mother learned a potential reason why. It appeared that Cindy and Jackie used babysitting as a cover story so they could go to a party three blocks from their home. Interviewing the people at the party did little to help investigators. Some witnesses said the girls were at the party, some said they never arrived, and some claimed that they made it to the party but only stayed there briefly. It has therefore been difficult for investigators to develop a solid timeline of the girls' movements once they left home. The lack of physical evidence and the uncertainty over Cindy and Jackie's actions on the night they disappeared made developing leads in their case very difficult for police. Jack Leslie passed away in the spring of 1975, less than a year after his girls went missing. While their father died not knowing what happened to Cindy and Jackie, their mother has spent the past four decades trying to avoid the same fate. Irma Leslie eventually remarried and moved to Nevada. She has traveled extensively throughout the western United States, following up on reported sightings of her two daughters. Irma and her daughter Linda have both submitted DNA samples to the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office in hopes that one day those samples will help them get answers in the case. As of 2018, Jackie and Cindy's fate remains unknown. Seven-year-old Alexis Patterson was a first-grade student at the High Mount Boulevard Community School in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the spring of 2002. While she lived less than a block away from her school, her stepfather, the Ron Burgess, would still walk her there in the mornings. On the morning of May 3rd, he walked her to the school and watched her walk onto the playground with her pink Barbie backpack. Alexis would not return home from school. Alexis was absent from class that day. However, students reported seeing her on the playground and some claimed that she was crying. While the school was the last place Alexis was seen, that does not necessarily mean that was the location she went missing from. Alexis was a well-behaved child with no history of trying to run away. However, the night before she went missing, Alexis got into an argument with her mother, Iana Patterson. Iana did not think that Alexis finished her homework properly, and as a punishment, Alexis was not allowed to bring cupcakes to school for her classmates as planned. Angry at her mother, Alexis could have wandered off after refusing to go into class and been abducted off of school grounds. However, this theory is challenged by some students who say they saw Alexis on the school playground after school. Perhaps Alexis acted out and did not go into school but did not want her mother to find out. So she remained at the school playground for the entire time she was supposed to be in class. Given the short distance between her home and the school, if Alexis were abducted in the afternoon, it could not have been very far from the schoolyard. Supporting the idea that Alexis was abducted from the High Mount School were reports of a mysterious red truck. Students reported seeing a red truck parked near the school in the days leading up to Alexis going missing. The truck did not drop off or pick up any children. Sightings of the vehicle ceased after Alexis went missing. A solid link between the truck and Alexis' disappearance has never been made. The search for Alexis was one of the largest in Milwaukee's history. Officers and volunteers performed land and water searches and helicopters were used to search larger areas. However, the investigation was not without controversy. Authorities were criticized for focusing on the criminal backgrounds of some of Alexis' family members. Alexis' father, Kenya Campbell, was in the process of being released from prison on multiple driving without a license charges when Alexis went missing. While he could not have been directly involved with his daughter's disappearance, he agreed to meet with authorities and cooperated with the investigation. Lauren Burgess, Alexis' stepfather and the last known adult to see her, had a far more troubling criminal past. He had served two years in prison for drug charges and had received immunity in return for his testimony. About his role as a getaway car driver in a 1994 bank robbery that resulted in the death of a police officer. There are also unconfirmed reports that he failed a polygraph about Alexis's disappearance. However, there has never been any evidence linking anyone in Alexis's life to her disappearance. In 2016, hopes were high that Alexis was alive and well. A man from Ohio called authorities claiming to know a woman who could be Alexis. This woman supposedly had no memory of her life prior to the age of 10 and bore a strong resemblance to an age-progressive image of Alexis released in 2012. The woman in Ohio did not believe she was Alexis. She provided police with documents that verified her true identity. 
Police in Bryan, Ohio, still obtained a voluntary DNA sample from the woman and sent it to Wisconsin. Tests showed that the woman was not Alexis. But these findings are controversial to many close to the case. Following the announcement that the DNA samples did not match, the man who originally alerted the authorities to the woman in Ohio came forward to speak to the media. The man who has only ever been publicly identified by his first name, Joshua, so as to prevent the public from being able to infer the woman's identity was the ex-husband of the woman whose DNA was tested. Joshua alleges that the original test used a sample from a toothbrush collected in 2002 that did not conclusively belong to Alexis. The police have never confirmed where they obtained their sample from. Both Joshua and Alexis' mother Ayana believe that Joshua's ex-wife is Alexis. They have been petitioning authorities to perform a new DNA test using a sample from Ayana to test against the DNA from the woman they believe to be Alexis, as they believe the woman to have been conclusively ruled out as Alexis. A wreath is laid out at the High Mount School every year as part of a ceremony to commemorate Alexis on the anniversary of her disappearance. Alexis' mother, who divorced Alexis' stepfather shortly after Alexis went missing, faithfully attends despite how emotionally taxing it is for her. While she believes her daughter is the Ohio woman ruled out by police, Ayanna Patterson still struggles with not being able to bring her child home. Bianca LeBron was a confident and outgoing fifth grader at the Elias House School in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The 10-year-old loved to shop and her favorite color was purple. She lived with her mother, Carmelita Torres, and her stepfather, Angelo Garcia. While they were no longer together, Carmelita and Wilberto LeBron, Bianca's father, maintained a good relationship as they raised their daughter. On the morning of November 7, 2001, Bianca ate breakfast as her mother got ready to leave for work. Bianca and four of her cousins walked the two blocks from her home together as they did every day. Their custom was to also walk home from school together, but Bianca would not be with them to walk home that afternoon. At 4.30 p.m., Carmelita became concerned because Bianca had not returned home. This was not immediately alarming, however. Bianca had lots of relatives who lived within walking distance of her home, and she loved to spend time with her many friends. This would not have been the first time she had failed to call home to report whose house she was visiting after school. She had once even spent the night with a friend without telling her mother, not understanding the panic that it would cause her. However, when 8.30 rolled around with no sign of Bianca, her mother began searching for her. Having no luck finding Bianca with her family or friends, Carmelita called the police at 10.30 p.m. The Elias House School was obviously an important site in this case. Police went to the school in the morning to interview school staff and Bianca's classmates. Bianca had made it to school that morning and had been waiting in line to enter the building with her teacher and other students in her class. She told some of her friends that her uncle would be taking her shopping that day. As Bianca loved to shop, this did not seem strange. Just before she entered the building, Bianca told her teacher that she was going to speak with her uncle. Teacher did not stop her. Students at the school reported seeing Bianca get into a dilapidated two-tone brown van with a Hispanic male driver in his early 20s. The man did not try to obscure his face from the crowd of students and Bianca seemed to be going willingly so her friends assumed that the man was Bianca's uncle picking her up for her shopping trip. There was just one problem. Bianca did not have an uncle. Based on interviews with the students and the police were able to develop a sketch of the man believed to have abducted Bianca. In April of 2002, police announced that they were trying to locate a 20-year-old man named Jason Gonzalez whose actual name will be discovered to be Jason Lara. Police did not name Jason as a suspect, rather as an acquaintance of Bianca's. However, Jason resembled the composite image of the man Bianca left school with, and he had a friend who owned a van similar to the one the man had been driving. He had a criminal record that began before Bianca went missing and extended well after. He had also left Bridgeport less than a month after Bianca disappeared. Jason knew Bianca because his mother was dating Bianca's great-uncle. While it is known that the two knew each other, the full extent of their interactions has been highly debated. In the wake of Bianca's disappearance, reports ranged from Bianca having a simple girl heard crush on him to allegations that witnesses had seen the man kissing the little girl. Jason and his family have always maintained that he was never inappropriate with Bianca and that he had nothing to do with her disappearance. Jason eventually met with police, but they alleged that he was not very cooperative. While Jason appears to be a solid suspect on paper, no actual evidence connects him to Bianca's abduction and he has an alibi for the time it occurred. 
Despite Bianca's family doing everything from appearing on television shows, consulting psychics, and giving interviews to local newspapers, few leads have surfaced in the case over the years. In 2009, police dug up large sections of Bridgeport Seaside Park after receiving a tip that Bianca had been buried there. Nothing was recovered. While Carmelita Torres has never wavered in her belief that her daughter is still alive and will one day be found, she had Bianca declared legally dead so as to file a wrongful death suit against the Elias House School. In the immediate aftermath of Bianca's disappearance, the Elias House School suspended Bianca's teacher without pay and updated their security and attendance policies. However, this did not undo the negligence shown when Bianca was allowed to leave school property with a man whose identity was not verified. Carmelita was ultimately awarded $750,000. The Elias House School has since been shut down. As a result of Bianca's disappearance, the once civil relationship between her parents has turned sour. They only communicate through their attorneys. Carmelita Torres eventually moved out of the home she shared with Bianca after more than a decade of waiting there for her daughter to come home. Bianca's father, Wilberto, moved to Florida where he walked his three other children way up to the door of their schools every day for fear that one of them might meet the same fate as their sister. As of 2018, if she is still alive, Bianca will be 27 years old. Carrie Sada was a student at the Albert Einstein Hebrew Day School in Las Vegas, Nevada. On October 25, 1978, the six-year-old was enjoying the playground at lunchtime. Unlike his classmates, Carrie would never make it back to class. Students reported an unfamiliar Rolls Royce on the school grounds around the time Carrie vanished. According to a 12-year-old student at the school, Carrie had been forced into the car by one of the four men who were riding in it. Approximately three hours after Carrie had last been seen, a neighbor of the Seas, who was in their home to help Carrie's distraught parents, answered their phone. It was a ransom call. The caller demanded that Carrie's parents prepare $500,000 to be exchanged for their son. He stated that he would call back on that Friday, the 27th, with further instructions on how to pay the money and get Carrie back, without any further communication from the kidnappers. While $500,000 is not an insignificant amount of money, Carrie's father was in a position where he could have procured it. Sol Seda had started a carpet business upon emigrating to the United States, and by 1978, the business was very successful. Early on in the investigation, there were concerns that Sol may have been the reason for the kidnapping for less flattering reasons. At the time of the abduction, Sol Saya was under indictment for a conspiracy to bribe a gaming commission official. His trial had to be postponed because Kerry went missing and the charges were ultimately dropped on compassionate grounds. The theory that the bribery charge led to Kerry's abduction lost support quickly because an alternative theory gained traction even quicker. Police quickly focused in on a former employee of Seoul's, habitual criminal Gerald Burgess. Several students claimed to have seen Burgess at Kerry's school around the time he went missing. Burgess was known to the students because he would occasionally work as a handyman at the school. Burgess, who was dating one of the secretaries at the school, claimed he was only there to drop off lunch for his girlfriend's son. The neighbor who answered the ransom call also immediately identified the voice they heard as Gerald's. Suspicions against Gerald increased when he led police to one of Carrie's shoes out in the Nevada desert. Burgess claimed that he knew where the shoe would be because he had been contacted by the kidnappers and was acting as a go-between between them and the Saya family. He was not able to substantiate this claim. While most of the evidence against Burgess was circumstantial, in 1981 a grand jury indicted him on charges of kidnapping and attempting to obtain money under false pretenses in relation to Carrie's case. And in 1982 he went to trial. Burgess alleged that Carrie was alive and living in Israel, but again he could not substantiate these claims. Convicting Burgess was going to be a challenge from the onset of the trial, but it grew more and more difficult as it progressed. While several students claimed to have seen Burgess at the school, only the one student claimed to have seen Carrie being forced into the car. This student testified at the trial that Burgess was not the man he had seen force Carrie into the car. Burgess was acquitted due to lack of evidence. While Burgess never served time in relation to Carrie's case, he was not a free man for quite a long time after Carrie went missing. Burgess was convicted for a sexual assault he committed against a woman at the Albert Einstein Hebrew Day School just a week prior to Carrie going missing from there. He was also sentenced to 15 years in federal prison for swindling a couple from Texas out of $200,000.
Burgess's legal trouble continued later in his life and renewed suspicions about him in relation to Carrie's abduction. In 2000, Burgess was arrested by the FBI following an 18-month investigation. Burgess, who, as a convicted felon, was prohibited from so much as possessing a firearm or ammunition, sold weapons to an undercover FBI agent and a confidential witness. During one of these transactions, he also threatened the life of a mayor of Las Vegas and a former federal judge. In the other, he made arrangements to dispose of a body for the confidential witness. Burgess told the FBI's witness that he would get rid of the body by sealing it in a steel drum and burying it in the desert. He also claimed that this was the method he used to dispose of Carrie's body in 1978. Burgess had rented welding equipment just days before Carrie went missing. Burgess cannot be retried for kidnapping due to double jeopardy. He has never faced any additional charges in the case. Saul Sias Lee faced numerous more problems following the disappearance of his son. He sold his business in 1996, and in 1997, he and Carrie's mother, Marilyn, divorced. That same year, he wrote a number of bad checks in casinos and went into over $7 million in debt to them. He fled to Israel to avoid felony charges in relation to these bad checks, but returned to Las Vegas after negotiating a settlement with the casinos. His federal charges were dismissed once he upheld the conditions of the settlement. While circumstances seem to indicate that Kerry was killed by Gerald Burgess shortly after he went missing, his body has never been found and doubts about his fate remain. In the late 1990s, there were whispers that Kerry was alive and living in Boston, but nothing ever became of them. Josephine Depard, called Josie by her friends and family, was going through a transitional period at the beginning of 1984. The 26-year-old had separated from her husband and was preparing to go to family court with him to settle custody of their six-year-old daughter Lois. Following the separation, Josie had to move back into her mother's home on North Clinton Street in Olean, New York. While this was a setback for Josie, it was not a completely upsetting turn of events. She and her mother, Lois Cotwan, were very close as evidenced by the fact that Josie had named her daughter in honor of her mother. The oldest of seven children, Josie was very close with her siblings as well. Josie had also begun taking classes at Jamestown Community College in hopes of starting a career that could provide her daughter with a comfortable life. On the evening of February 7th, Josie left home at approximately 5 p.m. She was with a male acquaintance from the nearby town of Franklinville whom she knew through the community college. The man, Dale Varican, was never publicly identified by police until 2018. Josie supposedly was going to Dale's house so that they could swap stereo components. Josie never returned to the home on North Clinton Street. According to Dale, he and Josie had changed their plans, not going back to his house, but instead to the nearby Olean Center Mall. The two got coffee and Josie ran into some friends. He claimed that Josie left with these friends and the last time he saw her was at approximately 6 p.m. Dale was obviously heavily scrutinized by police assigned to Josie's case. None of Josie's known friends or acquaintances came forward identifying themselves as the people Josie went off with and no witnesses placed Josie or Dale at the Olean Mall. There have been rumors of witness statements placing Josie at a Perkins restaurant later on the night of February 7th, a group of unidentified men, but police have never been able to substantiate these claims. As far as investigators have been able to ascertain, Dale was the last person to see Josie before she vanished. Dale's behavior immediately after Josie's disappearance did not do anything to quash suspicions about him. Right after Josie went missing, he reportedly tried to flee the country. He was stopped at the Canadian border and charged with a parole and marijuana possession. He was then sent back to the United States. Dale committed suicide a few months later in October of 1984. Dale's suicide was a setback in the investigation into Josie's disappearance. While they had no proof that he had harmed Josie, both his behavior at the time of her disappearance and his background made him a person of interest to police. In 1981, Dale had been sentenced to two to six years in prison for two sexual assaults that took place in 1979. One of the victims was just 14 years old. A recon received credit towards a sentence for the six months he had spent in county jail while the charges were pending. The remainder of the time he had been in custody had been spent in a mental health facility following a suicide attempt in his cell and that time was not eligible to be used as time served. 
Despite these mental health issues, a psychiatrist who evaluated Dale testified at the 1981 trial that he had been able to distinguish between right and wrong at the time of the attack on the 14-year-old. It has been speculated that Dale's history of mental health problems was the reason police did not release his identity until 2018, while police remain skeptical about Dale's claims of innocence. He is not an official suspect in Josie's disappearance and he was never charged with any crimes in relation to it. With a major avenue of inquiry cut off so soon into the investigation, Josie's case had few leads to follow. Her case remained active but police never came closer to solving the mystery in the intervening years. That all changed in 2018. On February 7, 2018, the 34th anniversary of Josie's disappearance, an anonymous letter arrived at the Only M Police Department. The letter addressed to Captain Robert Blavsky and retired officers who had worked Josie's case has never been released to the public out of concern that doing so may jeopardize the investigation. Captain Blavsky has stated that the letter contained some information that he already knew as well as some information that he had speculated but never been able to verify. In an attempt to get the writer of the letter to come forward, the Only M Police Department posted an appeal on their official Facebook page and received cooperation from local media. Captain Blavsky has stated that while they would like to speak with the letter writer, that person is not in any trouble. The letter itself does not implicate the writer of the letter in Josie's disappearance. Blavsky also told the local television station that the information in the letter has investigators looking for three other individuals, although we could not identify them publicly. Josie's brother, Dominic Catoni, has also publicly expressed hope that the person who sent the letter would speak with police further. According to the Only M Police, eight or nine people came forward with information about Josie's case as a result of the publicity garnered by the letter. As of August 2018, the identity of the letter's author remains a mystery. Josie's family is aware that after 34 years, it is most likely that she is no longer alive. They would, however, like to locate her body so that they can give her a proper funeral and bury her next to her beloved mother. Josie's ex-husband, who was in California at the time of her disappearance and therefore never a suspect in the case, eventually remarried. Josie's daughter, Lois, was legally adopted by Josie's sister, Eileen Payne, and her husband, Dana, a few years after Josie went missing. Lois, now Lois Payne, grew up in Strongsville, Ohio, with the three brothers she gained upon being adopted. As an adult, she had a daughter of her own. Gladys Stella Kidd was a grandmother living in Moorhead, a small town in Rowan County, Kentucky. Gladys had been married for 49 years, but her husband, Stella, passed away in 1983. She was an active member of her church. In 1990, Gladys sold the remaining half of her farm. She had sold the first half of it back in 1988. In the beginning of August, she went to the to cash a $56,000 check she had received from the sale. Despite warnings from the bank staff, she insisted on taking the full amount in cash. After August 6, 1990, Gladys Stella Kid was never seen again. The only things found to be missing from Miss Kidd's home were the cash, a filing cabinet, and some clothes. She parked her car in town and left it there with the keys inside. Seventeen days after Miss Kidd was last seen, a letter postmarked in Lexington, Kentucky arrived at her son's home. The letter instructed her family not to look for her and said that she would leave again if they found her and forced her to return home. While this letter seems to indicate that Miss Kidd disappeared voluntarily, it has not been determined that she wrote it willingly. Miss Kidd's family believes that she was the victim of foul play and that she had been forced her killer to write the letter. The note was her killer's way of preventing an investigation into her disappearance and protecting himself from being caught. The family's concerns stemmed largely from a mysterious boyfriend who had been a part of Miss Kidd's life for the last few years prior to her disappearance. A few years after her husband's passing, Miss Kidd began corresponding on the phone and going on secret dates with a man that she refused to identify to anyone in her life. When calling Miss Kidd at home, this man would hang up the phone if anyone besides her picked up. Despite multiple family members pressing her for details on this man, Miss Kidd would always refuse to reveal his identity. All she would ever say was that he was a man known to the family and that they would be surprised when they did find out who he was. The secrecy around this relationship caused many people close to Miss Kidd to warn her to end it. According to the editor in the Moorhead News written by Miss Kidd's granddaughter, Sandra Nathanson, her family believed this man to be a predator. 
She further implied that this boyfriend was the reason that the proceeds Miss Kid earned from selling the first half of the family farm in 1988 mysteriously vanished. If this boyfriend had been using Miss Kid for money, he would have had no use for her after receiving the proceeds from the sale of the second half of their family farm. Having taken all of Miss Kid's assets, this individual could have seen her as a liability. Once she realized her boyfriend's interest in her was purely financial, Miss Kid would no longer be willing to conceal his identity. She therefore may have fallen victim to foul play to protect both her boyfriend's ill-gotten financial gains and his reputation in the community. The family's belief that Miss Kid met with foul play is supported by the fact that after she stopped collecting her social security checks and her driver's license was never renewed. Furthermore, her car was left in Moorhead. If she left town, someone else would have had to drive her. As no one else went missing from the area at the time, she clearly did not run off with her boyfriend to start a new life together. As of 2018, Miss Kid would be 99 years old. Even if she did not meet with foul play at the time of her disappearance, it is unlikely that she would still be alive today. As her family does believe she was murdered in 1990, they are still searching for answers so that the person who took her from them can be brought to justice. They had her name engraved on her husband's tombstone in the Crick Cemetery in Moorhead in hopes that one day she can be laid to rest next to him. Chalik Rainwalker's life was an uphill battle from the very beginning. Born addicted to crack cocaine on the floor of his biological grandmother's Albany, New York kitchen in August of 1995, he was also diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome shortly thereafter. As a result, he was removed from his biological mother and placed into foster care two days after his birth. Chalik spent the first several years of his life going from foster home to foster home. After living in five different homes, he was lucky enough to eventually be placed with Jody and Larry Schoen at age three. The couple cared for Chalik for four years and had plans for adopting him. However, Chalik's difficult beginnings would derail this bright future. Chalik had been diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder, a condition that can develop in children whose emotional and physical needs were not met early on in their development. The condition can have a wide range of psychological and emotional symptoms. Broadly speaking, children with this disorder cannot properly accept affection once they are finally given it. They have trouble asking for help, are severely withdrawn, and respond to affection and interaction in inappropriate ways. In addition to his red, Chalik's fetal alcohol syndrome may have contributed to his behavioral problems. FAS, which is caused when a child's mother consumes alcohol during her pregnancy, can result in a broad range of physical and psychological complications. Children with this syndrome often have learning disabilities, poor reasoning and judgment skills, and hyperactive behavior. Any of these effects could complicate Chalik's management of his red. The Shones have described Chalik as a loving and bright child who loved to read. Unfortunately, his psychological conditions did make caring for him difficult. When he became frustrated, Chalik was prone to violent episodes where he was essentially unmanageable for up to an hour. The Shones spent four years helping Chalik try to live a normal life. However, when Chalik was seven, he attacked the Shone's biological daughter. At that point, Jody and Larry decided that they were not equipped to properly manage Chalik's condition after all and decided not to continue with their plans to adopt him. After leaving the Shone home, Chalik was sent to live with Rosalind McDonald and Stephen Kerr, a married couple with four biological children and another foster child with special needs. Eighteen months later, the couple adopted Chalik along with his foster sister. Chalik's life with McDonald and Kerr was somewhat unconventional. Their rural home in Washington County, New York was a two-room shack with no electricity, running water, or indoor plumbing. This was reportedly done out of the couple's concerns for the environment. All of the children were also homeschooled rather than sent to traditional school, although they did participate in small homeschooling groups with other families. McDonald and Kerr did not provide any care for Chalik's special psychological needs. During the time he was with them, he was not receiving any sort of counseling or put on any type of medication. This is in spite of the fact that they received roughly $36,000 a year from the state to provide for the care of their two adopted children with special needs. McDonald's own mother has publicly stated that while she believes her daughter and son-in-law began fostering children for the right reasons, they eventually were drawn to caring for children with special needs because of the additional income they provided. Chalik's problems again came to a head in October of 2007 when he reportedly threatened a small child in the homeschooling group he and his siblings attended. 
The young boy had been pestering Chalik who had not been able to properly express his frustration and had instead lashed out with a threat of physical violence. Following this incident, Jocelyn McDonald no longer wanted Chalik in her home. Therefore, on October 23rd of 2007, Stephen Kerr called a crisis hotline. He told the caseworker he spoke to that Chalik was unmanageable and that he wanted to reverse the adoption. The caseworker told him that this was not possible. It in fact would have been to have Chalik removed from his family, but when Stephen hung up the phone that day, he believed that he had no legal means to remove Chalik from his home. At this point, Kerr and McDonald decided to take advantage of what is known as respite foster care. In respite foster care, a child is temporarily sent to live with a different licensed foster family during times when they are having difficulty with the family they have been living with. The break allows both the child and their families an opportunity to take a break and evaluate how best to improve their relationship going forward. On this occasion, Stephen Kerr took Chalik to the home of Elaine and Tom Person, who had provided respite care for Chalik since he had been seven. As respite care is only a short-term option, Chalik only stayed with Elaine and Tom for six days. When Stephen Kerr picked Chalik up from their home on November 1st, he told them that Chalik would be going to another respite foster home the following day. However, Chalik was going to have to stay with him for the night. Because Jocelyn still did not want Chalik in her home, Stephen took Chalik to his own parents' home on Hill Street in Greenwich, New York. Stephen's parents were out of town at the time, so Stephen and Chalik were alone in the house. The following morning, just before 9 a.m., Stephen Kerr called the police to report his son as a runaway. According to Kerr, he had awoken at 7.30 a.m. on November 2nd and been unable to locate Chalik. He found a note from Chalik that read, Dear everybody, I'm sorry for everything. I won't be a bother anymore. Goodbye, Chalik. Kerr believed Chalik to have been wearing blue jeans and a bright yellow fleece pullover when he went missing. He also stated that Chalik's duffel bag and his favorite stuffed animal had gone missing as well. Chalik's parents were only cooperative with authorities in the very early days of the investigation. They were interviewed by police on November 4th. On November 6th, Jocelyn McDonald complied with the request for her to take a polygraph examination, which she passed. On the same day, Stephen Kerr took the introductory portion of a polygraph but declined to complete the examination. The couple retained an attorney the following day. Kerr and McDonald held two vigils for Chalik, one on November 9th and one on November 16th. The latter vigil marked the last public showing of support for the search for Chalik by his parents. Stephen Kerr reportedly ripped down many of the missing persons flyers posted by volunteers and described Chalik as evil after he went missing. Concerns about Stephen Kerr's version of events sprung up almost immediately after Chalik went missing. Elaine Person, Chalik's respite foster mother, says that one of the assignments Kerr gave Chalik when he left him with her on that final stay was to write letters of apology to the people he had hurt. This included the students in the homeschool group where he was no longer allowed. While Elaine did not see the letters Chalik wrote, her husband Tom did see Chalik writing them. She believes the note Stephen Kerr gave the police was one of those apology notes. If Kerr knew what this note was, why did he misrepresent it to the police to support the idea that Chalik had run away? In January of 2008, Stephen Kerr was named a person of interest in Chalik's disappearance. According to authorities, they had video surveillance footage showing a gold minivan consistent with one Kerr owned driving through Greenwich around midnight when Kerr had claimed he was sleeping. Furthermore, cell phone data showed that Kerr had not taken the route to his father's home that he had detailed in his interview with police. The duffel bag and stuffed animal Kerr said Chalik had run away from home were found inside the garage of Kerr's parents' home. Another contentious layer of the mystery of Chalik's disappearance was added in January of 2008 when a typed letter was mailed to several media outlets in the area where Chalik went missing. The poorly written letter claimed that Chalik was still alive. The only real detail that seemed to validate the letter was the reference to a cat named Diamond which Chalik did have when he was living with his adopted family. The police accepted the letter as a lead, but those close to Chalik believe it to be a cruel hoax. According to a lame person, Chalik was too intelligent to have written such a grammatically incorrect letter. Compared to Chalik's handwritten letter given to police by Stephen Kerr, it certainly is at a much lower level of sophistication. In their investigation into the letter, police executed a search warrant on Stephen Kerr's father's home to take a computer into evidence. They were not able to determine if the letter had been written on that computer. 
Stephen Kerr and Jocelyn McDonald filed a lawsuit against the police department shortly thereafter, alleging that the search was improper and that police had illegally detained them during it. For months after Chalik went missing, his adoptive parents moved their family out of state. Greenwich police have been publicly very critical of Karen McDonald's lack of interest in their son's case. Chief George Bell of the Greenwich Police Department has stated in an interview that he has never seen such a lack of interest from the parents of a missing child. Karen McDonald do not contact the authorities to check in on Jalik's case. While Jalik's adoptive parents have not displayed an interest in this case, others who love him have stepped up to fight for Jalik. Efforts to locate Jalik have been led largely by his adoptive maternal grandparents, Barbara Riley and Dennis Smith. In the wake of Jalik's disappearance, when their daughter and son-in-law stopped cooperating with authorities, Riley and Smith attempted to gain legal custody of Jalik so that they could expedite the investigation through their own cooperation. This move was without legal precedent in the United States and was ultimately unsuccessful. As a result of their involvement in Jalik's case, they have become estranged from their daughter and grandchildren. Soon after Kara and McDonald stopped cooperating with the police, Riley and Smith helped form a task force to facilitate the search for their grandson. Also on the task force were Jalik's former foster parents, Jody and Larry Schoen, and Tom and Elaine Person. Elaine took a leave of absence from her job managing a small nonprofit to lead the task force and focus on efforts on Jalik's behalf full-time. These efforts included searches, media outreach, and fundraising to create a reward for information in Jalik's case. While Kara and McDonald did initially post a $25,000 reward for Jalik's return, it decreased by $5,000 every month and therefore was gone quickly. The task force relied on activities like bake sales and spaghetti dinners to raise funds for a new reward. A local deli offered a free weekly lunch for life to the person who could claim the reward. And a local business owner donated a $250 gift card to Walmart. While this piece together reward may not be large monetarily, the efforts made by the community to put it together are valuable beyond measure. Barbara Riley's work on behalf of Jalik further chipped away at the validity of Stephen's account of Jalik's disappearance in July of 2008. As part of her own investigation, she decided to search the abandoned home site Jalik's family had been living in before they moved away. There, she found the yellow fleece pullover that Stephen claimed had gone missing with Jalik. Police, acting on Riley's discovery, searched the home and removed a piece of clothing from although they did not disclose if it was in fact the yellow fleece. In response, Jocelyn McDonald had her mother arrested for burglary. In 2012, state and local authorities held a press conference to announce that Jalik's case was being reclassified from a missing persons investigation to a probable child homicide. At the conference, they also finally confirmed that Jalik's yellow fleece had been recovered after he went missing and announced that they had just performed a new search with the Dabber Dogs based on a tip from the public. The search was unsuccessful. Jalik's adoptive parents did not attend the press conference. Barbara Riley and Dennis Smith instead represented their grandson. Speaking through their lawyer, Karen McDonald expressed confusion at the reclassification. They still held their belief that Jalik was alive, having run away to live with a black family. Jalik was biracial, half African American, and half white, and grew up in a county that was over 90% white. He therefore had few people around him who physically resembled him. Reconciling the two halves of his racial identity probably was difficult for a young boy with no real connection to one of those halves. McDonald and Kerr have stated that Jalik identified as black rather than biracial and probably ran away to live with other black people. It is understandable that Jalik would seek out black role models. However, the notion that he could have made his way to a more diverse area, much less remain hidden there for so long, at his age and with no resources, is essentially incomprehensible. Upon the reclassification of Jalik's case as a probable homicide, the authorities did not name any official suspects. However, as the last person to see Jalik and the person whose account of events has faced so many challenges, Stephen Kerr falls under a cloud of suspicion for many. This includes Barbara Riley, who bases her concerns on Kerr's history of anger management, which twice necessitated therapy. She alleges to have once witnessed Kerr become so angry with Jalik that he dragged him outside of their rural home and repeatedly dumped him in a nearby creek. If Kerr were involved with the foul play that really believes took her grandson from her, she does not think that it was a premeditated act, but rather an impulsive act of rage. Even though authorities believe Jalik met with foul play, there are mixed opinions as to whether anyone could be convicted in relation to his death. Locating his remains would obviously make such a conviction much easier. 
when a partial skull was located in the area of Jalik's disappearance in the spring of 2016, many hoped that Jalik could be laid to rest. Unfortunately, tests showed that the skull did not belong to the missing boy. A few of the investigators, who have a more complete knowledge of the case than the public, have stated to the media that they believe that there is enough evidence to successfully get a conviction in the case. However, until Jalik's remains are found or more witnesses come forward, it is unlikely that he will receive justice. Before we continue, we have a surprise for you. We have made a new channel in which we upload cold mystery cases that will shiver your timbers. Don't miss out, link is in description. Bernard Ross Jr., known affectionately as Bunny, was 18 years old and living in his home in 1977. On the morning of May 12th of that year, Bunny was in a state of extreme emotional distress. Some reports indicate that he had been taking the antipsychotic drug Thorazine at this time, but there is little supporting evidence for this claim. What is known is that on that morning, Bunny left his family home in his parents' car without asking permission to use it. The car was later found at the home of his aunt who lived roughly an hour away in Preskell, Maine. It is possible that Bunny had driven to the house in hopes of speaking with his cousin, who also lived there. Bunny and his cousin were reportedly very close. While the Ross family car was unexpectedly found at Bunny's aunt's house, another vehicle was unexpectedly missing from it. On that day, a painter had been working inside the Prescal home. His truck went missing from the driveway outside of the house. It was later found undamaged along a dirt road in Ashland, a town west of Prescal. It appeared that for unknown reasons, Bunny had abandoned his parents' car and stolen the painter's truck from his aunt's driveway. Prior to this incident, Bunny had no criminal record. As best as his family and investigators can tell, this was a move purely made out of panic. When the painter learned of Bunny's emotional state at the time he appears to have taken, he declined to press charges in the matter, meaning that Bunny's record remains clean. Bunny has remained missing since May 12, 1977. There were unconfirmed sightings of him in wooded areas around Ashland around the time he went missing, but extensive searches by law enforcement and the Ross family have never turned up evidence of his whereabouts. Bunny's status as a missing person in the Maine State Police database led to him being featured in the Maine news media throughout the years. 39 years after Bunny went missing, news coverage would help lead to a major development in the case. In 2016, Bunny's parents, Bernard Sr. and Carol, were living in Portland, Maine. Early in the year, they received an anonymous letter from someone claiming to have information about what happened to Bunny. The letter indicated that the writer had seen a recent article about Bunny in the Kennebec Journal and suggested that the paper run another story about the case. The Rosses took the letter to the Maine State Police. Ultimately, in May 2016, Maine State Police Lieutenant Troy Gardner decided to contact the media about the letter's existence and arranged for Carol and Bernard to be interviewed by the Portland Press Herald. The exact contents of the letter have not been released to the public so as to protect the integrity of the investigation. Lieutenant Gardner's desire to increase media coverage in the case had a dual purpose to both reach out to the letter writer and increase public awareness of the case. While the information in the letter has not been verified, Lieutenant Gardner feels that it is important for him to speak with the letter's author. He indicated in his own interview with the Press Herald that the cooperation with the media was meant to be an olive branch to the person who sent the letter. Lieutenant Gardner believes that speaking to the individual who sent the letter is necessary to either verify its contents and move the case forward or show that the letter is a hoax and close off that avenue of investigation. Even if the letter is merely a hoax, the Ross family deserves to know. The family has now endured over four decades of searches, sleepless nights, and requests to look at John Doe's from all around the country in an effort to learn of Bunny's fate. Learning if the letter is authentic or not will at least answer one of the millions of that must have plagued the Ross family since they lost their son others years ago. Whether the letter is factual and moves the investigation forward or is a terrible joke, hopefully the attention it has garnered will one way or another bring closure to Bunny's case. Arnie F. Hopkins was born on June 30, 1928. During World War II, he served in the United States Air Force. In January of 1982, he was sworn in as a deputy sheriff of Livingston County, Kentucky. Unfortunately, his career in public service would ultimately end tragically. September 9, 1984 was a Sunday. Deputy Hopkins was out on patrol outside of Smithland, Kentucky. 
At approximately 11.20 p.m., he called into dispatch to report that he would be exiting his patrol vehicle to investigate a suspicious hitchhiker. He reported his location as the intersection of U.S. Highway 60 and Kentucky Route 137, an intersection known locally as the Monument. A few minutes later, a dispatcher on his way into work came across Deputy Hopkins' empty patrol car at the monument. He noticed signs of a struggle and Deputy Hopkins lying on the ground. The deputy had been shot with his own service weapon and was dead by the time the dispatcher found him just minutes after his last radio contact. 56-year-old Hopkins was survived by his wife, Rose. There was no sign of the hitchhiker to be found. The hitchhiker was the obvious prime suspect in the case, but authorities were never able to identify him. Deputy Hopkins did not provide any physical description of the hitchhiker, due to the fact that this person had been hitchhiking near U.S. Route 60, which spins 2,700 miles from western Arizona to coastal Virginia. He could have caught a ride to several different states, making a search area difficult to identify. Deputy Hopkins' case went cold, but it was reopened by the Kentucky State Police in 2017. The state police claims to have new information in the case, but has not revealed this information to the public. They are actively seeking tips from the public and following new leads in the case. However, for now, the identity of Deputy Hopkins' killer remains unknown. On March 24, 1976, a fisherman in Nashville, Tennessee discovered the body of a young woman washed up against a branch in the shallow waters of the Harpeth River. She was estimated to have been between 14 and 17 years of age, 5 feet 2 inches in height, and of Hispanic or Native American descent. The medical examiner determined that she had probably been dead for less than 24 hours. However, the girl's cause of death was far more difficult to determine. While the girl had drowned, whether she did so accidentally or as the result of foul play could establish. The teenager's blood alcohol was measured at a 0.28, meaning that it was possible she fell into the river accidentally and drowned in the two feet of water due to her incapacitation by alcohol. However, the girl's shirt had been removed and her pants were unbuttoned. Her body also had bruising on her chest and legs. These facts opened up the possibility that she had drowned following some sort of sexual attack. Unable to use science to determine the girl's cause of death, police hoped that they could determine if a crime had been committed by finding out the last known events in her life. To do so, they would need to identify her so that they could locate those close to her. As the young woman carried no identification with her, police had to rely on alternative means to try to uncover the identity of their Jane Doe. While she did not carry ID, the Jane Doe did carry a nickel, a comb, and a picture of a young boy in her pockets. The photograph would be the key to getting the most information police have about the Jane Doe. The photograph of a young blonde boy had the name Little Charlie written on the front. On the back was written a phone number. Police assumed that Little Charlie was the boy in the photo. They discovered that Little Charlie was really a 24-year-old man from East Nashville. Charles Moore lived with his father, also named Charles, and the two went by Little Charlie and Big Charlie respectively to distinguish them from one another. When he spoke to police, he was able to tell them how his number had ended up on the back of the picture of the boy. On March 15, 1976, nine days before Jane Doe's body was discovered, Moore had been traveling southeast on Interstate 24 with his brother-in-law, Milton Collins. The two men came across two female hitchhikers and offered them a ride. According to Moore, one of these hitchhikers matched Jane Doe's description. She called herself either Sherry or Cheryl. The other one was a thin young woman with dirty blonde hair and wire-rimmed glasses. The two young women told Moore and Collins that they had run away from a treatment center in Minnesota, where the future Jane Doe was being treated for substance abuse and the blonde woman was being treated for suicidal ideation. The two said they were on their way to Haines City, Florida, where the blonde woman's husband and son lived. Moore gave the hitchhikers his phone number in case they were ever passing through Nashville again. The only piece of paper any of the four people in the truck had was a photograph of the blonde woman's son, so he wrote the phone number on the back of it. Moore told police that he and his brother-in-law dropped the two hitchhikers off roughly 85 miles southeast of Nashville. The last time he saw them, they were getting into another vehicle and continuing on to the southeast. This location was over 90 miles away from where Jane Doe's body was found and in the opposite direction from where they had been traveling when Collins and Moore last saw them. Both Collins and Moore viewed Jane Doe's body in 1976 and were able to confirm that she was one of the hitchhikers they picked up. 
Milton Collins has since passed away, but Charles Moore continued to speak with police as recently as 2012 as part of their ongoing efforts to identify Jane Doe. Authorities do not believe either Collins or Moore had anything to do with Jane Doe's death. Police have never been able to locate or identify the blonde woman traveling with their Jane Doe. They were also unable to identify a treatment center in Minnesota where patients matching the two young women's descriptions escaped from. Authorities continue to hope that they will one day find a match to Jane Doe's fingerprints or dental records. Unfortunately, DNA testing is not available in this case. The grave markers in the burial and it is unclear where her body is now located. In 2013, Detective Jill Weaver of the Nashville Police Department's Cold Case Unit took over Jane Doe's case and has been focused on the numerous questions that remained unanswered in it. The identity of Jane Doe, the circumstances of her death, and the identity of her potential killer all remain mysteries. Jennifer Mary Beard was a friend of 1969. She was engaged to a man named Reg Williams who led backpacking, or tramping as it is known in the area, groups in the scenic outdoors of New Zealand. Jennifer and Reg had arranged to go tramping through the mountains of New Zealand's South Island together. Because of their schedules, they agreed to travel separately and rendezvous in the town of Wanaka to begin their hike into the mountains after Reg finished leading a tramping group through Milford Sound. They were due to meet on January 5, 1970. Jennifer never arrived. On January 9th, Reg reported her missing. Jennifer had been planning to hitchhike down the west coast of the South Island to meet up with Reg. This left a huge area to search for the missing teacher. Detective Emmett Mitten, the lead investigator on the case, initiated a huge search along Jennifer's planned route, largely in areas that were difficult to access. The search area was narrowed following eyewitnesses coming forward. Jennifer was last seen near Fox Glacier, being driven by a balding middle-aged man in a blue or green Vauxhall Velox on December 31, 1969. After the sighting was announced to the public, a family came forward to tell police that on December 31st at approximately 1.20 p.m. at the rest area near the Haas River Bridge to help a middle-aged man in a teal voxel having car trouble. Since this description matched the man and vehicle Jennifer had last been seen with, police were dispatched on January 19, 1970 to search the area around the bridge. Shortly after making their way under the bridge, officers tragically located the remains of Jennifer Beard. When Jennifer was found, her pants were around her ankles and her shirt had been torn apart. She was missing her backpack and camera. Police hypothesized that Jennifer had gone beneath the bridge from the rest area to use the bathroom and had been sexually assaulted and killed. The person who had last picture of hitchhiking was an obvious suspect, especially since Jennifer's belongings were not in the area. Jennifer would not have taken her belongings down with her to relieve herself. If the driver she had been with followed her down to attack her, he may have forgotten that her effects were in his vehicle and disposed of them elsewhere so as not to be caught with them. The state of Jennifer's remains made confirming this theory impossible, however. Due to the combination of the delay in finding Jennifer, the hot New Zealand summer, and the ebbing and flowing of the Haas River, the remains were severely decomposed by the time they were located. The coroner was not able to pinpoint a cause of death. Police put forth the theory that Jennifer had been strangled, but her hyoid bone, which often breaks or is damaged in strangling victims, was not located with the remains and therefore could not be examined. Since the body was not able to provide police with many leads, they turned their attention to the voxel. Almost 30,000 voxels manufactured between 1953 and 1955, like the one described by eyewitnesses, were still being driven in New Zealand. Authorities checked thousands of them, never finding any evidence tied to Jennifer's case. The only real suspect authorities had to pursue was a man named Gordon Bray. For days after Jennifer's body was discovered, police located a pair of jeans a few hundred feet away from the crime scene. The jeans stayed in an evidence refrigerator for three months before ever being examined. In one of the pockets of the jeans was a receipt with both Bray's name and address on it. Bray also drove a Vauxhall of approximately the same age as the one described by witnesses and had been in the area on December 31st. Police believed they had cracked the case, while authorities thought they had definitively identified Jennifer's killer. Proving it to the legal standard necessary was difficult. Bray did not meet the physical description of the fat and balding man Jennifer had been seen with, and his car was in much better shape than the beat-up and dust-covered Vauxhall described by eyewitnesses. The color of the car also raised issues with the eyewitness testimony. 
The car Jennifer was seen in was described as being various shades of turquoise or bluish green. The discrepancies aside, Bray's car was a dark blue. As such, the eyewitness testimony was shaky and hardly conclusively tied Bray to Jennifer. Bray had also agreed to be interviewed by Detective Inspector Mitten and allowed his voxel to be searched. He did not say anything incriminating and no evidence was found in his vehicle. While the receipt in the jeans was the one major piece of evidence in the case, even it posed problems for the prosecution. The distance away from the crime scene that the jeans were found alone raised suspicions that they could have been planted by police. The four days in between when Jennifer was discovered and the area was made a crime scene and when the jeans were finally found, as well as the three months the jeans were supposedly misplaced, could also be presented by a defense lawyer as evidence that the police had time to concoct a plan to frame someone for the crime. Bray's family furthermore has said that they have never seen him wear jeans. As police could not definitively say how Jennifer died, they could not even state for sure that she had been murdered rather than been the victim of some sort of accident. While police remained convinced that Bray was the killer, the lawyers who would have had to try the case were not. Not feeling as though they could successfully convince a jury of Bray's guilt, prosecutors announced on June 26, 1971 that Bray would not be charged in Jennifer's death. Bray died in November of 2003, having maintained his innocence the rest of his life. In 2005, a new suspect in the case finally emerged. A man named Ron. Hunter had been working at the Hardy and Thompson Sawmill in the town of Westport around the time of Jennifer's death. After a police sketch of the man Jennifer had last been seen with appeared in the newspaper, he abruptly left town, despite being owed two weeks' worth of pay from his job. Gordon Watts, who managed the sawmill and employed Ron Hunter, claims that he went to police with his information in 1970, but it was never followed up on. Emmett Mitten, who by that time had retired from the police force, says he never received such a tip. Given the amount of time since Jennifer Beard's death, unless someone confesses to being her killer, it seems likely that her case may never be solved. On June 10, 1976, the body of a young man was found in a landfill in rural Tooele County, Utah. The man had brown hair and dark eyes. He was estimated to have been approximately 5 feet 9 inches tall and between 17 and 22 years of age. He had also been shot twice in the nearby town of Wendover the day prior to the discovery of a body. Authorities were unable to unearth any further information about their John Doe. For the next four decades, the identity of the John Doe was just as unknown as the identity of his killer. One half of the mystery of the John Doe's murder will be solved 39 years after his death. The Tooele County Sheriff's Office, while not considering John Doe's murder case to be an open investigation since very soon after his discovery, did make efforts to utilize new technologies to identify the young man as they became available. In 2010, John Doe's information was uploaded to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children for help developing a composite image of what John Doe would have looked like when he was alive. The sheriff's office put his likeness on posters around Tooele County and hoped that it would help identify him. In the fall of 2014, the sheriff's office partnered with the Utah State Medical Examiner's Office in an effort to close cold cases. Through this joint effort, a set of dental records belonging to a missing person were found to be a very close match to the John Doe's records. The John Doe's body was exhumed in May of 2015 in order to collect DNA samples from it. In August, it was announced that the DNA confirmed the identity of the Tooele County John Doe. His name was David Stack. David Arthur Stack had been born on July 5, 1957. In 1975, he graduated from New Milford High School in Connecticut. Despite being one of ten children, he managed to stand out amongst his siblings for his charismatic and adventurous nature. In 1976, he had been living in Broomfield, Colorado. He left his home there on June 1st to hitchhike out to California to visit family. But he never reached his destination. In the years when he was missing, Dave's family had hoped that he was apart from them because of his wanderlust rather than foul play. His brother James liked to think that he had gone off to Alaska to start a new adventure. Both of Dave's parents passed away prior to the identification of his body. While the Stack family finally knows what became of Dave and were finally able to hold a memorial service for him, his identification still left them with many questions. While the Tooele County Sheriff's Office finally had an identity for their John Doe, they did not have the identity of his killer. Dave's case remains open in Tooele County as an unsolved homicide case. 
Mark Trubenbach spent the evening of August 19, 1992, watching television in his Manassas, Wisconsin apartment with his sister and a friend. They were awaiting the arrival of Mark's girlfriend, 20-year-old Lori Deppis. Mark and Lori had seen each other earlier in the day, but had parted when Lori had to go in for her shift at the graffiti store in the Fox River Mall in the nearby town of Grand Chute. She had planned on picking up a gift she had purchased for Mark while she was at work. She was excited to give the gift, a ring, to Mark, so they made plans for her to come to his apartment right after her closing shift. At approximately 10.15, Lori's arrival at Mark's apartment complex was announced by the loud roar of her muffler. Mark expected Lori to knock at his door shortly thereafter. She never did. After a few minutes, Mark walked out, over his balcony to see where she was. In the parking lot of the apartment complex, he saw Lori's 1984 Volkswagen Rabbit. He did not see Lori. The only sign that she had been there was a cup of soda left sitting on the roof of her car. Mark, his friend, and his sister went out to look for Lori but had no success. So at 11.45 that night, they called the local police to report her missing. When the police spoke to Lori's co-worker, they were able to establish a timeline of the last few hours prior to her disappearance. She had taken a dinner break at around 6 p.m. and gone to pick up the ring for Mark at another store in the mall at approximately 7 p.m. Graffiti closed at 9 o'clock, but Lori and her co-worker stayed to close registers and clean up until 9.50. The last time the co-worker saw Lori was just before 10 when she was turning to go east on College Avenue on her way to Mark's apartment. Despite intense local media coverage and a major effort to blanket the area with missing flyers, few viable leads surfaced in the immediate aftermath of Lori's disappearance. The police received calls about the case, but none of the information ever provided a solid line of inquiry. The presumed crime scene showed no real sign of a struggle and the only real physical evidence, Lori's car and the soda cup, did not really provide any useful DNA or fingerprint evidence. It really did seem as though Lori really vanished into thin air. While authorities continued to work the case, the investigation seemed cold almost from the start. Just as abruptly as Lori's case became stagnant, it came roaring back to life in 2011. In May of that year, authorities announced that the previous November, a man had confessed to kidnapping and killing Lori. That man was named Larry Dwayne Hall. When he made his confession, Larry Hall was serving a life sentence at a North Carolina federal penitentiary for the kidnapping of Jessica Roche, a 15-year-old from Georgetown, Illinois. She was last seen riding her bike outside of Georgetown on September 20, 1993. More than a month. Later, her body was discovered in Indiana. Due to a legal technicality and the fact that authorities could not identify which state Jessica had been killed in, Hall could not be convicted of her murder. Instead, he was incarcerated under a federal kidnapping charge. Hall had been connected to Lori's case since 1995, when a published report claimed that Hall confessed to abducting and killing her. This confession supposedly came after police found a diary in Hall's car in which he detailed multiple crimes he had committed. Authorities immediately discredited this report. In 2011, however, investigators on Lurie's case were much more optimistic that they were going to be able to resolve the case. Hall really had confessed to the crime of 2010 and supposedly provided details that only the police and the killer could know. These details were not released to the public, so as not to jeopardize any future prosecution of Hall. Lieutenant Mike Kruger claimed that Hall's account of the crime was the most credible lead they had received since Lori disappeared. On the surface, it seemed plausible that Hall could be guilty. He had been in that area of Wisconsin at the time of Lori's disappearance for a Civil War reenactment. While the media reports of a diary being found were false, the FBI did find various writings and notes in Hall's vehicle after his arrest. The words Lori and Fox River Mall were found among these ratings. According to Hall, he had seen Lori in the Fox River Mall earlier in the day on August 19th and had approached her to ask her out for pizza. She had said no, telling him she was going to meet someone. He later followed her to her boyfriend's apartment complex from the mall. He claimed that he called her over to his car to look at an album of photos of antique cars. Hall then says he blacked out. The next memory he has is of Lori being tied up and him assaulting and killing her. While Lori's case appeared to have been solved, the case against Hall began to fall apart as soon as police attempted to verify it. They perform an exhaustive search of an area of southern Wisconsin. Again, the exact location has not been revealed to the public where Hall claimed to have dumped the bodies of Lori and three other women. The bodies were not there. 
Investigators have acknowledged that Hall's confession may simply be a bid to avoid the death penalty. In various interviews with the press, Hall has admitted or alluded to guilt or involvement in up to 40 crimes. This includes the well-known disappearance of Susie Streeter, Stacey McCall, and Cheryl Levitt, better known as the Springfield Three. These crimes cover multiple years and multiple states, committed as Larry traveled extensively to participate in Civil War reenactments. However, the only authorities he has cooperated with have been the ones in charge of Lori's case, since Wisconsin does not have the death. Penalty, investigators have to be concerned that Hall confessed to Lori's murder out of self-preservation rather than actual guilt. In speaking to author Christopher Martin, Hall has specifically stated that he is afraid of the possibility of execution. Further complicating the possibility of Hall's involvement is his identical twin brother, Gary Wayne Hall. The twins participated in Civil War reenactments together, meaning that Gary was also in Wisconsin when Lori disappeared. Should Lori's body ever be found, even if Larry Hall's DNA were found on it, there would be no way to distinguish that DNA from that of Gary. The circumstantial evidence that ties Larry to the location of the crime also ties Gary to it. If Larry ever did get brought to trial for Lori's abduction and murder, Gary could be used to create reasonable doubt. Prosecutors have stated multiple times that they will not prosecute Larry Hall until they have physical evidence to corroborate his story. As promising as his confession was, they have too much reason to doubt it. The most glaring problem with the confession is obviously Hall's inability to accurately identify the location of Lori's body. His blackouts, which he also alleges took place during his other crimes, provide him with the opportunity to avoid providing important details which could confirm his involvement if they are correct or be used to prove that he is lying if he gets them wrong. While Lori's name and the name of the mall she worked at were suspicious things to be found written down in Hall's vehicle, it is important to remember that he was in the area of her disappearance at the time she went missing. There was a massive effort to cover the area in missing persons posters in the days after Lori went missing, and the case was heavily featured in the local media. Hall could have simply jotted down the information after seeing a poster or watching the news. He also could have seen Lori at the Fox River Mall as he claimed his confession, but that does not necessarily mean that he followed or abducted her. For these reasons, until corroborating evidence is discovered, Lori's case is officially considered unsolved and remains an open investigation. In 2012, Lieutenant Mike Kruger, the lead investigator on the case from the town of Monash, a police department, retired. Kruger had been on Lori's case since the very beginning and had become close with her parents over the 20 years he had kept them appraised of the state of the investigation. Despite his years of effort and a myriad of reports on Lori's appearance, he had to retire without resolving her case. Upon his retirement, the investigation was officially turned over to Wisconsin State Wisconsin State Division of Criminal Investigation. On June 1, 1997, Kristen Modifery marked her 18th birthday by flying across the country from her home in Charlotte, North Carolina to San Francisco. The North Carolina State University student had visited San Francisco in 1994 on a family vacation and fallen in love with the city. She therefore decided to spend the summer in between her freshman and sophomore years of college in San Francisco taking a summer photography class at the University of California at Berkeley. She rented a room in a house on Jane Street in Oakland and got two different jobs, one of which was in Spinelli's Coffee House in San Francisco's Crocker Galleria Mall. She was scheduled to begin her course at Berkeley on June 24th. She would never make it to class, however, as she mysteriously disappeared the day before on June 23rd, 1997. After finishing her shift at Spinelli's at 3 p.m. that Monday, Kristen withdrew cash from an ATM. Her co-workers reported seeing her walking with a blonde woman on the mall's second level at approximately 345. This woman has never been identified, nor has she ever come forward to provide information to the police. While the authorities have no evidence of wrongdoing on this woman's part, they obviously would like to interview her as she could potentially have information critical to the investigation. The investigation into Kristen's disappearance was complicated by the fact that she was 18. The investigation into Kristen's disappearance was complicated by the fact that she was 18. If she had gone missing just a few weeks earlier, she would have legally been considered a child. Since she became an adult 22 days prior to her disappearance, the additional resources available in missing children cases were not available to investigators. Furthermore, it meant that her parents were not immediately made aware that she was missing. 
The police were not obligated to alert parents that an adult child was missing, so Debbie and Bob Modifery did not learn that Kristen had vanished until three days later when they called the house she had been staying in and spoke to one of her roommates. They immediately flew to San Francisco and began to post flyers and speak to anyone and everyone they could about Kristen's case. Investigators were able to make some headway early in the investigation and identify several avenues of inquiry. Police dogs traced Kristen's scent to the number 38 bus stop outside of the Crocker Galleria. On the day that she went missing, Kristen had asked her co-worker for directions to Baker Beach. The number 38 bus drives to Sochaux Park Beach, which is separated from Baker Beach by Land's End Beach. Kristen's scent was tracked to near the water, opening the possibility that she had been swept out to sea. A search of her rented room uncovered a personal ad from a newspaper that read, Friends. Female seeking friends to share activities who enjoy music, photography, working out, walks, coffee, or simply the beach exploring the Bay Area. Interested, call me. Police were, however, not able to determine if Kristen had placed the ad, answered it, or simply clipped it from the newspaper but not acted on it. As such, they were not able to investigate anyone she may or may not have met through the ad. The most notorious lead in the investigation came in on July 10th when a man called a San Francisco television station claiming to know what happened to Kristen. The caller identified two women that he claimed had killed Kristen after she had spurned their romantic advances. As sensational as the story was, it was quickly discredited when the caller was identified. When police interviewed the two women accused of killing Kristen in the call, they informed police that they believed the man who made the phone call was named John Onuma. Onuma had been harassing the two women because of conflicts they had been having at work. With Onuma's then-girlfriend, Jill Lampo, the two women were cleared of involvement in Kristen's disappearance, but suspicions about John Onuma were just beginning to develop. When police interviewed Onuma, he admitted that he had made up the allegations against Jill Lampo's co-workers simply to cause problems for them. However, police were concerned by the fact that Onuma had drawn attention to himself in regards to Kristen's case and with inconsistencies in his statements to them. When the Oakland police wanted to question Onuma further in 1999 but could not locate him, they asked America's Most Wanted to run a segment on him. During the segment, the show interviewed two women who claimed to have been involved with and assaulted by Onuma. Neither woman ever filed charges against him. One woman claimed that Onuma struck her over the head, told her he had to kill her, and said, now you know what happened to Kristen Modifery. This claim and the phone call are the only things tying Onuma to Kristen's case. Despite the lack of physical evidence, both Onuma and Jill Lampo remain persons of interest to the Oakland police. The FBI, which also looked into Kristen's disappearance, has cleared Onuma and Lampo as persons of interest. The FBI has since closed their file on Kristen's case. The more recent developments in Kristen's case point closer to her rented home in Oakland rather than San Francisco. In 2015, retired detective Paul Dotsie and his three-legged search dog Buster searched the Oakland house where Kristen had been living just prior to her disappearance. Buster alerted to the scent of human remains at vents coming from the home's basement and at a drainage pipe outside of it. Oakland police brought in scientists from Chico State University to use ground-penetrating radar in the home's basement, which had been searched when Kristen first went missing. A dig was performed in the basement, but ultimately no new evidence was found. In 2017, Dotsie returned to Jane Avenue with Dr. Arpad Voss, a forensic anthropologist who specializes in human decomposition, and his team. Dr. Voss' work on the case was done on a volunteer basis, independent of law enforcement. The two obtained permission from the owners of both the house where Kristen had rented a room and the one next door to it, which had been a halfway house in 1997, to perform a search and experiment. Using a device he developed, Dr. Voss identified an area between the two houses where he believes Kristen's blood was present. In this scenario, Jane Street would be a crime scene but not the location where Kristen's body was disposed of. Using DNA samples provided by Kristen's parents, Dr. Voss was able to claim that remnants of Kristen's blood were found amongst the decomposition chemicals found at the site. While these results are promising, they have not resulted in Kristen's case being reclassified as a homicide. The device Dr. Voss used in his work on the Jane Avenue site is proprietary and currently under review to receive a patent. As such, he cannot disclose exactly how the device works. Because the details of the methods used to make these determinations cannot be made public, it is unknown at this time if these results meet the legal standards needed to use them in court. 
The Oakland police cannot consider these findings evidence until they are able to independently verify them in their own lab. Dr. Voss has been sending Oakland investigators instructions on how to do so without the benefit of his device. As of the making of this video, Kristen's case is still classified as an open missing persons case. Susan Lyle had an exceptional mind. Born on April 6, 1978 in upstate New York, Suzanne was a gifted student who ultimately graduated high school with honors and a talented writer with a particular fondness for poetry. That being said, Suzanne's intelligence was perhaps most clearly illustrated by her interest in and proficiency with computers. She taught her middle and high school teachers about how to use and fix computers rather than the other way around. She left the first university she attended, the State University of New York at Oneota, because she was too advanced for the computer science courses there. She transferred to SUNY Albany for a more challenging curriculum and supported herself with two computer-related jobs, one at a computer firm in nearby Troy and the other at the Babbage's software store in the Crossgates Mall. Suzanne's job at the Crossgates Mall would become inextricably linked to her disappearance. On March 2, 1998, Suzanne took a midterm before leaving campus to start work at Babbage's at 4 o'clock. After the store closed at 9 p.m., Suzanne quickly changed clothes and rushed to catch a 920 bus back to campus. A classmate of Suzanne's waiting at the bus stop at Collins Circle back at the SUNY Albany campus saw Suzanne get off the bus at approximately 9.45. This would be the last time anyone saw Suzanne. Suzanne's mother Mary received a phone call on the morning of March 3rd as she was getting ready to go to lunch with her son as a belated celebration of her birthday. On the other end of the phone was Suzanne's boyfriend, Richard. He informed her that Suzanne had not returned to her dorm room the night before. Richard attended a different university than Suzanne, and while his school was only a short distance away from hers, he only indirectly knew that Suzanne hadn't made it back to her dorm room on the night of March 2nd. Suzanne's routine would be to get back to her dorm room around 9.45 and either call Richard or speak with him over the computer. Richard claims that after he failed to hear from Suzanne, he tried calling her multiple times and he could not reach her online. When he still could not get a hold of her by the following morning, he reached out to her parents. The various pieces of eyewitness and circumstantial evidence indicate that something caused Suzanne to go missing during a very short period of time after she got off the bus on campus before she could get back to her dorm room. Investigators were eventually able to speak with the driver of the bus, which Suzanne rode back to Collins Circle to confirm that Suzanne did in fact leave the mall on the night of March 2nd. As Suzanne frequently rode that bus line at that same time, the bus driver was able to recognize her from a photograph and confirm that she boarded the bus the night she was last seen. He could confirm that she exited the bus as she was not on it at the end of his route, but he did not personally witness her disembarking at Collins Circle. As such, Suzanne's classmate provides the only eyewitness testimony that shows she made it back to campus. In terms of physical evidence, Suzanne's out-of-date Babbage's work ID was found near a parking lot adjacent to Collins Circle, but not until two months after her disappearance. This was potentially due to it being buried under snow that fell the week following her disappearance. While the badge was found in rough shape, there is no way to determine if Suzanne dropped it on the night she disappeared. She could have dropped it sometime prior, or someone could have placed it there at some time after Suzanne went missing to throw off the investigation. As such, the badge is not definitive proof that Suzanne got off the bus at Collins Circle, but it remains possible that she dropped the badge there the night she disappeared. Immediately after the phone call from Richard, Suzanne's father Doug drove from the Lyle family home to the university. He spent most of the first day of the search for Suzanne waiting in SUNY Albany's campus security office. He spent most of the first day of the search for Suzanne waiting in SUNY Albany's campus security office. Campus police first checked the class Suzanne should have been in that morning. When she failed to show up in that class, officers then moved on to searching the rest of campus. While her husband was dealing with the search for Suzanne at SUNY Albany, Mary Lyle remained at home near the phone. While she was waiting expectantly for some news of her daughter's whereabouts, she realized she had a lead she could follow. Suzanne's bank records. Mary had access to Suzanne's bank accounts and as such was able to call Suzanne's bank to check her debit card activity. In doing so, Mary would stumble upon one of the most puzzling clues in the investigation into Suzanne's disappearance. While Mary Lyle was on the phone with the bank just before 4 p.m. on March 3rd, the day after Suzanne went missing, the system showed that Suzanne's debit card had just been used. 
Due to the technology at the time, the bank would not be able to tell where the transaction had taken place until the next day. The transaction, a $20 withdrawal from an ATM, had been made at a Stewart's convenience store a few miles away from the SUNY Albany campus. Whoever made the withdrawal had entered Suzanne's PIN number correctly on the first attempt. According to Suzanne's boyfriend Richard, only he and Suzanne knew what that number was. Obtaining the security footage from that store obviously became a top priority for investigators. Unfortunately, the ATM was not visible to the store's camera, which instead was pointed towards the cash register. Suzanne did not appear in any of the footage from the security camera. Police were able to identify the majority of the customers who were seen in the footage from the time of the ATM transaction and interview them. None of them claimed to have seen Suzanne inside the store. There was one patron of the store who could not immediately be identified and became one of the most publicized leads in the early months of the investigation. The man was commonly referred to as the Nike man because the most identifiable thing about him in the grainy security footage was a Nike logo on his hat. The Nike man generated a lot of interest in the early days of the investigation. A composite of the man was featured alongside Suzanne's picture on a billboard asking the public for help in her case. He was heavily featured in early media coverage of Suzanne's disappearance. However, when police were finally able to identify the man in early 1999, their interview with him proved fruitless. While the man had made a purchase in the Stewart store around the time of the ATM transaction, he did not witness anything useful or have any discernible link to the case. Another person police were interested in talking to early in the investigation was Suzanne's boyfriend, Richard. Richard spoke with police in the immediate aftermath of Suzanne's disappearance, but later on hired a lawyer and was not as easily accessible to authorities. Richard claimed to have an alibi for the time of Suzanne's disappearance, telling police that he had been playing video games with a friend. The two friends had not been playing the game in the same location, but rather over the internet. Police accepted this alibi after speaking with this friend, who said he was sure it had been Richard playing with him because he could identify the moves Richard habitually used in the game. Mary Lyle, however, has not been so quick to dismiss Suzanne's boyfriend as a suspect. Suzanne and Richard had been dating for over two years, but their relationship was not a smooth one. Suzanne had tried to break up with Richard on more than one occasion, but would take him back every time because he would get so upset. Mary suspects that two weeks prior to Suzanne's disappearance, when Suzanne asked her to drive to Richard's house so that she could drop off a Valentine card for him, she was really dropping off a letter that was ending their relationship. Mary detailed some of her concerns about Richard and the behavior of some of his family members following Suzanne's disappearance in an interview with the Unfound podcast in 2016. A link to that interview will be in the description of this video. Richard is not an official suspect in the case and has never been charged with any crime in relation to it. In 2001, Suzanne's parents decided to use their family's tragedy to try to help others. Doug and Mary co-founded the Center for Hope, a nonprofit organization designed to help families of people who have gone missing. The center has created numerous print guides to help families navigate the legal system and pursued various creative efforts to spread awareness about unresolved disappearances. Doug and Murray's activism also extended to the political arena and resulted in the passage of multiple state and federal laws that improve how missing persons' cases are handled. For example, Suzanne's law, signed by President George W. Bush in 2003 as a part of the National Amber Alert Bell, mandated police to notify the National Crime Information Center when a person up to the age of 21, rather than 18, goes missing. Despite his years of activism for missing people and their families, Doug Lyle never received resolution to the mystery that spurred him to action. He passed away in August of 2015, never learning the fate of his youngest daughter. According to Mary, he spoke about Suzanne even in his final days. In April of 2018, during the week when she should have been celebrating Suzanne's 40th birthday, Mary was awarded the New York State Senate Liberty Medal, the highest honor the Senate can present to an individual. She was presented with the medal during the ceremony for the 17th annual New York State Missing Persons Day, a commemoration the Center for Hope had pushed to have created. Mark Donald Raymond was born on the 4th of July of 1961 at the Tompkins County Hospital in Ithaca, New York. He remained in his hometown for his entire childhood, graduating from the Immaculate Conception School and Ithaca High School. He left Ithaca to serve in the Army following his high school graduation, but returned after he had completed his service. 
He then took a job at the Woolworths department store in the Pyramid Mall in nearby Lansing, New York, where he would work for 17 years. 2002 began harshly for 40-year-old Mark. At the beginning of January, he was laid off from his place of employment at the Pyramid Mall. This came just two years after the struggling Woolworths chain had closed its location at the mall, meaning Mark lost his long-term and stable job. Hoping to hold on to some sense of the life he had been living for the past almost 20 years, Mark began to search for employment at a different store within the familiar Pyramid Mall. This is what he was doing on the night of January 18, 2002. That night, he was seen sometime between 9.30 and 10 p.m. in the mall's food court before leaving on foot. This will be the last confirmed sighting of Mark. At 7.30 a.m. on January 19th, Mark's brother, who was also his roommate, called their mother, Kathy Bierce, to tell her that Mark had not returned home from the mall the night before. She, in turn, notified the authorities. The home Mark shared with his brother was close to the Pyramid Mall, a nearby Winthrop Drive. The police worked under the assumption that Mark had been walking home, as was his routine when he disappeared. They therefore performed a thorough search of the immediate area. They were, however, unable to find any clues that would aid in their investigation. There was one potential sighting of Mark in a nearby wooded area on the 19th, the day after he was last positively seen, but this sighting has never been verified. None of Mark's credit cards or bank accounts have ever been accessed since his disappearance. Mark's family has always insisted that Mark did not vanish voluntarily. His mother has publicly asserted that Mark was too committed to his highly regimented daily routine illustrated by his long-standing employment at Woolworths and his desire to remain working in the St. Mall and too committed to his family, as evidenced by the fact that he lived with his brother even into adulthood to walk away from his life without saying a word. He also did not have the resources to do so without using his bank accounts or credit cards. The Tompkins County Sheriff's Department supports the family's assertions and does believe that foul play was involved in Mark's disappearance. Mark's family is one of the many helped by Doug and Mary Lyles Center for Hope. Mark's mother, Kathy, viewed the Lyles as a lifeline to my family and many other families that have missing loved ones. She also credited them as being instrumental in having Mark included in several statewide missing persons initiatives, including the New York State Playing Cards Program. The program produces decks of playing cards, each of which features a photo of irrelevant information about a missing person or a victim of an unsolved crime. The decks are distributed throughout the state, including within the prison system, in hopes of generating information on the cases. Mark is featured as the aid of clubs. Unfortunately, Kathy Bierce would eventually have more in common with Doug Lyle than just a missing child. She passed away on August 15, 2016, after battling pancreatic cancer. Like Doug, she died having never received answers about what happened to her child. This was in spite of her ongoing efforts to try to keep Mark's case in the local media. As of June 2018, Mark Raymond would be 56 years old. He has dark hair, he's allies, and is 5 feet 5 inches. He requires glasses to see, and the glasses he wore at the time of his disappearance were gold-rimmed. He is also missing the tip of his right middle finger, having lost it in an accident prior to his disappearance.